The world of organized crime has witnessed the rise of many heavyweights, particularly those who have become infamous for their unbridled brutality. These dangerous figures have left an indelible mark on the criminal landscape. The evolution of the mafia into subtle business-like enterprises has put a damper on the violence mafia bosses of the past wrought. That is why even in 2023, several years after most of these infamous men have ceased to exist, their legacies continue to live on. Matteo Messina Denaro. In the world of crime, there are those who become legendary, and then there's a league above, inhabited by the likes of Matteo Messina Denaro, a name whispered with reverence and fear throughout the dark alleys of Sicily. He wasn't just another mob boss, he was Diabolic, the uncatchable comic book thief brought to life in the flesh. His tale begins in Castelvetrano, Sicily in April 1962, under the watchful eye of his father, Francesco, known as Don Ciccio, the head of the Sicilian Cosa Nostra Mafia in the Trapani region. From a under age, Messina Denaro was marinated in the Mafia lifestyle. At 14, he was already being groomed to wield a gun, and by the time he reached 18, the young Diabolic had allegedly committed his first murder. His criminal journey, marked by violence and ruthlessness, was just beginning. One of the most haunting chapters in Messina Denaro's grisly saga was his involvement in the 1992 killing of prosecutor Giovanni Falcone. The prosecutor met a tragic end as part of an assassination bombing orchestrated by the Mafia, but the horror didn't stop there. In a sinister move to prevent Mafia turncoat Santino Di Matteo from testifying against his former associates after the bombing, the unthinkable happened. Matteo's 11-year-old son was kidnapped. Messina Denaro found himself in a group that went on to torture the young boy relentlessly before ultimately strangling him to death. For a harrowing 779 days, the innocent child was held hostage, his fate sealed by merciless hands that would dissolve his remains in acid. This act of cruelty sent shockwaves throughout Sicily and beyond but that wasn't the end of the violence. Messina Denaro was also held responsible for a series of bombings in Rome, Florence, and Milan in 1993, claiming the lives of 10 people and leaving 93 others injured. The Cosa Nostra unleashed a reign of terror, and Messina Denaro was a key player in their ruthless strategy to force the Italian state into retreat. As a sinister shadow of death and destruction loomed over Italy, it became increasingly apparent that Messina Denaro was no ordinary criminal. His body count was immeasurable, and he was rumored to have once boasted I filled a cemetery all by myself. In the summer of 1993, as Italy reeled from the Mafia's reign of terror, Messina Denaro vanished into thin air. His disappearance coincided with the arrest of former Mafia top boss Salvatore Riina. It was at this point that Messina Denaro joined the ranks of the most wanted criminals globally, landing a spot on Forbes' list of the 10 most wanted and powerful criminals in the world in 2010. As years turned into decades, Messina Denaro remained elusive, a phantom lurking in the shadows. His life is a fugitive was far from miserable. He played video games and entertained numerous girlfriends while being actively shielded by fellow mobsters who tipped him off about any impending police raids. The code of silence, Omerta, was sacrosanct to his supporters and compliant townspeople who would never reveal his whereabouts. Despite close calls and false dawns for the police, they remained one step behind the elusive mob boss. In 2021, an unfortunate Formula One fan from Liverpool was arrested by Dutch police, who had mistakenly identified him as Messina Denaro. But then, in a twist of fate on a fateful day in January 2023, the tides turned. After 30 years of fugitive life, Messina Denaro was finally arrested in Sicily by Italian police. His capture came almost exactly three decades after the arrest of Riina, who had been taken into custody on the 15th of January 1993, also in Palermo. The capture of the elusive boss was not without its own intrigue. Investigators confirmed his illness and the necessity for treatment at a Palermo clinic, which ultimately ended his reign as perhaps the last mafia secret keeper. Over 100 members of the armed forces were involved in the arrest, and Messina Denaro was detained at a private clinic where he was receiving treatment for colon cancer. He had reportedly visited the clinic under a fake name for chemotherapy. Italian media reports estimated Messina Denaro's assets to be worth at least a whopping 4 billion euros at the time of his arrest. During the night, Messina Denaro was secretly flown to the prison of L'Aquila under the Article 41 Biz prison regime. This prison boasted an oncology ward and was the closest facility to Rome where he could be interrogated by Italian magistrates. Yet the world would never hear his side of the story in a courtroom. On the 24th of September, 2023, a twist of fate took center stage once more. Messina Denaro slipped into an irreversible coma, and as the world watched, he passed away in the early morning on the 25th of September, 2023, taking all his secrets with him to the grave. Salvatore Riina 
Enter the story of Salvatore Toto Riina, the ruthless mafia boss known as The Beast, the man who went from humble beginnings to being a ruthless murderer who orchestrated the deaths of judges, policemen, and prosecutors, as well as anyone he deemed a rival to his criminal enterprise. Riina was born in 1930 in the poverty-stricken village of Corleone. His early years were marked by tragedy. His father found a bomb and attempted to open it to sell the powder and metal, but he inadvertently set it off, and it claimed the lives of his father and younger brother, leaving Riina's other brother scarred by the explosion. At the tender age of 19, Riina's path to infamy began when he was sentenced to a 12-year prison term for taking a life in a heated brawl. In 1956, he emerged from behind bars, his spirit unbroken. The Corleone Mafia family was under the sway of Michele Navarra until 1958 when Luciano Leggio, a ruthless mafioso, orchestrated Navarra's violent demise. Riina, Calogero Bagarella, and Bernardo Provenzano, key players in Navarra's assassination, subsequently ascended, fueling the rise of the Corleonese. In the early 1960s, as arrest warrants loomed, Riina and his compatriots went into hiding after a series of murders. Although Riina and Leggio stood trial in 1969 for earlier killings, they escaped conviction due to jury intimidation. Riina, however, would remain a fugitive for the next 23 years. With Leggio incarcerated in 1974, Riina seized control of the Corleonese, steering them toward unprecedented power. He forged alliances with the Endrangheta, the Calabrian Mafia, and counted on powerful figures like Domenico Tripodo as close associates. The 1980s marked a harrowing period as Rina embarked on the Second Mafia War. His primary rivals, Stefano Bontade, Salvatore Inzerio, and Tano Badalamenti, were mercilessly eliminated, with up to a thousand lives claimed in the brutal conflict. The Corleonesi, led by Rina, emerged as the undisputed rulers of the Mafia as they had successfully wiped out their rivals. Now, Mafia bosses before Rina were very adept at hiding, to the point some people in law enforcement began to question the very existence of the Mafia. Rina, unlike his predecessors, chose not to hide in the shadows. Instead, he unleashed a reign of terror, orchestrating the murders of judges, policemen, and prosecutors. Pio Latore's law to combat the Mafia, which had languished in Parliament for years, was finally enacted after Latore's murder in 1982. The year 1982 saw further tragedies, with the assassination of Carlo Alberto Dalla Chiesa, a general tasked with crushing the Mafia, along with his wife and driver bodyguard. In response to mounting public outrage and escalating violence, La Torre's law was passed, signaling a turning point in the fight against organized crime. Rina's ruthlessness knew no bounds. He targeted Busetta, a high-profile mafioso, and his family, unleashing a relentless wave of violence. Busetta's sons, brother, son-in-law, and nephews were all claimed by the merciless vendetta. Busetta, cornered and devastated, made the fateful decision to cooperate with Italian authorities. His revelations shattered the myth of the mafia's decentralization, unveiling the existence of a single organization led by a commission, with the top echelons complicit in all its crimes. In an attempt to divert attention from Busetta's explosive disclosures, Rina sanctioned the Christmas Massacre of 1984. The horrific train, 904 bombing claimed 17 lives and left 267 wounded, initially attributed to political extremists, but ultimately revealed as the handiwork of the mafia. The wave of terror reached its zenith in 1992, when Judge Giovanni Falcone, his wife Francesca Morvio, and three police officers perished in the Capacci bombing. Two months later, Judge Paolo Borsellino and five police officers were slain in a car bomb attack in Via D'Amelio. Riina masterminded both atrocities, seeking to cripple the judicial system. These heinous crimes ignited public outrage and prompted the Italian government to launch an unprecedented crackdown on the mafia. Rina was sentenced to life in prison for the murders of Falcone and Borsellino, but his reign of terror was far from over. On a fateful day in January 1993, Carabinieri officers apprehended Riina at his Palermo villa, ending his 23-year fugitive status. The beast was finally in captivity, but the scars of his brutality would forever haunt Sicily. Salvatore Rina's story is one of unbridled ambition, unrelenting violence, and the resilience of those who dared to defy the darkness of the mafia. Roy DeMio in the gritty streets of Brooklyn, where the shadows concealed horrors beyond imagination, a name struck fear into the hearts of all who heard it, Roy Albert DeMeo. Roy's journey into the underworld began in the heart of Flatlands, Brooklyn. Born in 1940 to Italian immigrants, he came from humble beginnings. The streets of Brooklyn raised him, and by the time he graduated from James Madison High School in 1959, he was already making a name for himself as a loan shark. But DeMeo's path was destined for something far darker. He was soon drawn into the labyrinth 
clandestine world of organized crime, initially aligning with the Flatlands Canarsie faction of the Lucchese crime family. They controlled everything from tow truck companies to car theft operations in Brooklyn, a world where Roy would thrive. His fortunes changed when Anthony Gaggi, a soldier in the Gambino crime family, saw potential in him. Gaggi convinced Roy to join the Gambinos, promising even greater wealth and power. With this shift, DeMio's rise truly began, and he assembled a crew that would become infamous both in the underworld and among law enforcement. The DeMeo crew was a deadly mix of young, ruthless men. Among them was Chris Rosenberg, just 16 when he crossed paths with Roy. Rosenberg's entry marked the crew's genesis, soon followed by a roster of cold-blooded associates, including Joseph and Patrick Testa, Anthony Center, and others. As the 1970s unfolded, the crew's actions grew increasingly gruesome. Their signature method of execution, known as the Gemini Method, was born in the dark corners of the Gemini Lounge, their hideout. Victims were lured into the lounge, shot in the head, almost always by Roy himself, and stabbed in the heart to ensure a swift end. Stabbing in the heart also stopped more blood from flowing out the gunshot wound. Then the victim would be placed in the bathroom where the blood would drain out to reduce the messiness of what came next. The bodies were then dismembered, their parts meticulously concealed and disposed of in plastic bags and cardboard boxes. The Gemini Lounge, once a hub of criminal activity, became a chilling slaughterhouse. Victims met their gruesome fate within its walls, and the crew honed their macabre craft. But not all victims met the same fate. Some were left in the streets, their lifeless forms serving as a warning to those who dared to oppose the crew. Of the people who weren't subjected to the grim fate of dismemberment, one of them was his old friend Rosenberg, who betrayed a Cuban drug deal, leading to the murder of a Cuban man and his associates. Fearing reprisals from the Cuban cartel, DeMeo hesitated but eventually obeyed orders to eliminate Rosenberg. Then came a chilling public murder of an innocent college student, Dominic Ragucci, mistaken for a Cuban hitman. Ragucci was chased and shot dead by DeMeo, who, burdened by guilt, fled with his family. Gaggi, outraged, demanded Rosenberg's death to prevent more innocent victims. On a fateful night in 1979, Rosenberg was lured to the Gemini clubhouse. DeMeo fired a shot, hesitating briefly when Rosenberg didn't fall, causing another crew member to finish the job. Unlike previous victims, Rosenberg's body was left to be found, as the Cubans insisted his death made newspaper headlines. Rosenberg's murder haunted DeMeo, isolating him in grief for days. The crew's reign of terror would not go unopposed. A conflict with Andre Katz, a young auto repair shop owner, led to Katz revealing the crew's secrets to the authorities. The stage was set for a deadly confrontation, one that would claim Katz's life in a gruesome manner, stabbed, decapitated, and crushed. As law enforcement closed in on the DeMeo crew, they uncovered the horrifying extent of their crimes. The crew's victims were disposed of in the Fountain Avenue dump, their remains lost among tons of garbage, an eerie testament to their methodical brutality. In Roy DeMeo's final days, paranoia consumed him. He knew that death loomed on the horizon and contemplated faking his own demise. On January 10th, 1983, he attended a meeting with his men, never to be seen again by his family. Ten days later, DeMeo's abandoned Cadillac was discovered, an ominous sign of his fate. When law enforcement opened the trunk, they found his lifeless body partially frozen and riddled with gunshot wounds. The man who had orchestrated countless horrors was silenced forever. Roy Albert DeMeo's reign of terror had come to an end, leaving behind a trail of gruesome crimes that would forever haunt the annals of criminal history. The Gemini Method, the crew's chilling signature, had left an indelible mark on the dark underbelly of Brooklyn, a stark reminder of the horrors that can lurk in the shadows. Vito Genovese Vito Genovese's life circled around power, betrayal, and unbridled ambition. His story is a tale that stretches from the winding streets of Italy to the gritty neighborhoods of New York City. Vito Genovese was born on November 21, 1897, in Resigliano, Italy, a place shrouded in the mystique of the old country. His humble beginnings gave no hint of the notorious figure he would become. Genovese's father was Francis Felice Genovese, and his mother was Nunziata Aluoto. He grew up with a sister and two brothers, Michael and Carmine, both of whom would later become part of Genovese's criminal empire. In 1913, at the age of 15, Genovese's life took a momentous turn. His family embarked on a voyage across the Atlantic, seeking a new life in the land of opportunity, the United States. Their journey aboard the SS Tormina deposited them in the heart of Little Italy, Manhattan. Little did anyone know that this unassuming teenager would go on to shape the American mafia. Genovese's criminal apprenticeship began with small-time thefts from pushcart vendors and running errands for mobsters. These early 
early experiences were the crucible in which his criminal prowess was forged. He soon graduated to more lucrative criminal activities, like collecting money from illicit lotteries. However, trouble soon came knocking. At 19, Genovese found himself behind bars for a year due to illegal possession of a firearm, a mere blip in his criminal journey. The 1920s ushered in the era of prohibition, transforming the criminal landscape. Genovese found himself in the employ of Giuseppe Joe the Boss Masseria, a powerful gang leader. Alongside him were rising stars like Lucky Luciano and Frank Costello. The trio ventured into bootlegging, seizing the opportunity created by prohibition to amass wealth and power. But it was a counterfeiting operation in 1930 that nearly spelled Genovese's doom. Law enforcement uncovered a staggering $1 million in counterfeit currency in a Brooklyn workshop linked to him. This brush with the law only added to his notoriety. In the same year, Genovese allegedly committed a chilling act, a murder that would set the stage for his ascent. Gaetano Reina, a Bronx-based gang leader and Masseria ally, fell under suspicion of aiding Masseria's arch-rival, Salvatore Maranzano. On February 26, 1930, Reina was ambushed and brutally shot in the head with a shotgun. Masseria assumed direct control of Reina's gang as a result. As the Castella Maurice war raged on, Genovese's loyalty shifted. A secret pact between Luciano and Maranzano spelled the end for Masseria. On April 15, 1931, Masseria met his demise at a restaurant on Coney Island, a cunningly orchestrated hit. Genovese played a role in this audacious murder, alongside figures like Albert Anastasia, Joe Adonis, and Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. With Masseria out of the picture, Luciano ascended, with Genovese as his trusted underboss. But the bloodshed was far from over. In September 1931, Luciano and Genovese devised a plan to eliminate Maranzano, who had become a threat. When Maranzano summoned them to a meeting, they knew it was a death trap. Instead, they dispatched Jewish gangsters to take out Maranzano, a move that solidified their control and led to the creation of the commission, the governing body of organized crime. Genovese's personal life was as turbulent as his criminal career. After his first wife, Donata Ragone, succumbed to tuberculosis, he married Anna Patillo. The circumstances of this marriage raised eyebrows, as Anna was previously married to Gerard Vernatico, a man whose life ended in strangulation. Genovese's involvement in this murder remained cloaked in secrecy. In a bid to legitimize his power, Genovese orchestrated a national Cosa Nostra meeting, what became known as the Appalachian Meeting in New York. This gathering was meant to solidify the syndicate's grip on various criminal activities, from narcotics to gambling. However, the meeting attracted the attention of law enforcement. Police suspicions led to a chaotic scene as mafiosi scrambled to evade capture. Genovese's grand ambitions eventually led to his undoing. He faced indictment on narcotics conspiracy charges, aided by the questionable testimony of a Puerto Rican drug dealer. In 1959, he received a 15-year prison sentence. Even behind bars, he continued to exert control over his crime family. Family. To this day, the legitimacy of Genovese's conviction remains a subject of debate among detectives, lawyers, and organized crime experts. His life story is a riveting narrative of crime, power, and the intricate web of the Mafia. Charles Lucky Luciano there isn't anyone conversant about the Mafia in America who hasn't heard the name Salvatore Lucania, better known as Lucky Luciano. His life reads like a riveting noir tale, spanning continents and fueled by ambition, cunning, and ruthlessness. Born on November 24, 1897, in Lercara, Fridi, Sicily, Italy, Luciano's early life held no clue to the notorious figure he'd become. His parents, Antonio Lucania and Rosalia Caporelli, struggled to make ends meet, with Antonio toiling in a sulfur mine to support the family. In April, April 1906, at the tender age of eight, young Salvatore, along with his family, embarked on a life-changing journey. They left Sicily behind and set sail for the United States. Their destination, the Lower East Side of Manhattan, a magnet for Italian immigrants seeking a new life. Luciano's American story unfolded rapidly. When he was 14 years old, he dropped out of school, opting for a job delivering hats, earning a meager $7 per week. But fate had bigger plans. After a $244 windfall in a dice game, Luciano abandoned his job and embraced street life. Trouble soon followed. Luciano found himself at the Brooklyn Truancy School, a consequence of his truancy and delinquency. In the chaos of New York's streets, Luciano carved a niche for himself. He established his gang and joined the infamous Five Points Gang. But his approach was unconventional. Rather than engaging in petty crimes, Luciano offered protection services to Jewish youths for a modest fee of 10 cents per week. He also ventured into the world of pimping. During this turbulent period, Luciano's path intersected with another rising star. 
star, Meyer Lansky. Their first encounter was far from cordial, as Luciano attempted to extort protection money from Lansky. Instead of caving in, Lansky's defiant responses forged an enduring partnership. The origins of Luciano's nickname, Lucky, remain shrouded in mystery. Some say it sprang from his survival of a brutal assault that left him beaten and his throat slashed. Others attribute it to his gambling fortune. And then there's the possibility of a simple mispronunciation of his last name. Luciano's criminal record was extensive, boasting 25 arrests between 1916 and 1936. Yet he managed to evade prison time, leaving law enforcement baffled. The dawn of prohibition in 1920 marked a pivotal point in Luciano's criminal career. The 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution banned alcohol, setting the stage for an underground empire. Demand for illicit booze soared, birthing a thriving black market. By 1920, Luciano had crossed paths with future mafia luminaries like Vito Genovese and Frank Costello. Together, they embarked on bootlegging endeavors, capitalizing on the lucrative opportunities that Prohibition presented. Arnold, the brain Rothstein, a prominent gambler, mentored Luciano and honed his skills in the art of running bootleg alcohol. However, a 1923 sting operation revealed Luciano's involvement in selling heroin, tarnishing his reputation. In a savvy move to rehabilitate his image, he purchased 200 premium seats to a high-profile boxing match and distributed them to influential figures. This strategic PR move rescued his reputation. Luciano's ascent continued as he became a key player in Joe Masseria's criminal syndicate. Masseria lacked sophistication, manners, and management skills. The rivalry between Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano escalated into the brutal Castellamare's War. Masseria and Maranzano were entrenched in the old world, honor, tradition, respect, and dignity mindset of the Sicilian Mafia, refusing to collaborate with non-Italians or even non-Sicilians. Luciano, however, was forward-thinking and willing to work with anyone for profit. This stark contrast drove him to forge alliances with younger mobsters who shared his vision of a unified, lucrative criminal empire. Luciano's intricate maneuvering came to a head in 1931. He orchestrated the murder of Masseria, switching allegiance to Maranzano in a secret deal that made him second in command. Luckily for Lucky Luciano, a tip from Joe Adonis thwarted a plot to kill Luciano, revealing Masseria's intention to eliminate him. The infamous murder of Masseria took place at Nuova Villa Tamaro, with Luciano allegedly excusing himself to the restroom while gunmen, including Albert Anastasia, Vito Genovese, Joe Adonis, and Benjamin Bugsy Siegel carried out the hit. The bloodshed didn't end there. In the days that followed, Maranzano's rivals met gruesome fates, with some even disappearing without a trace. Luciano's rise to power was undeniable. Maranzano's death cleared the path for Luciano to ascend as the preeminent crime boss in the United States. He ushered in a new era, dismantling the title of Capo di Tutti Capi to avoid unnecessary power struggles. Instead, he maintained control through discreet alliances, ensuring peace and prosperity within the five families. Luciano's influence extended to labor unions, waterfront operations, garbage hauling, construction, the garment district, and trucking. His empire yielded colossal profits, with his crime family's income exceeding $12 million annually. Despite reaching the zenith of the criminal underworld, Luciano remained committed to Omerta, the code of silence. He upheld Maranzano's structure of five crime families in New York City and even retained the ceremonial made man tradition due to the advice of his close ally, Vito Genovese. Salvatore Lucania and Lucky Luciano reshaped organized crime in America. His vision of a unified syndicate, embracing Italian, Jewish, and Irish gangsters, transformed criminal activities into lucrative businesses for all involved. In his turbulent journey from Sicily to New York's mean streets, Luciano left an indelible mark on the American mafia. His name lives on, embodying ambition, cunning, and the enduring allure of organized crime. Albert Anastasia, the man nicknamed The Earthquake, Albert Anastasia, originally named Umberto Anastasio, was born in the picturesque town of Pargalia, Calabria, Italy, on September 26, 1902. He was the son of Bartolomeo Anastasio and Mariana Polistena. His father worked on the railway, but their humble existence took a tragic turn after World War I when his father passed away, leaving behind nine children. In 1919, a young and adventurous Anastasia, along with his brothers Joseph, Anthony, and Gerardo, embarked on a perilous journey. They abandoned a freighter they were working on in New York City and entered the United States illegally. Their new life began as longshoremen on the bustling Brooklyn waterfront. The early 1920s marked a turbulent period in Anastasia's life. In 1921, he faced a murder conviction for the killing of fellow longshoreman George Torino following a heated dispute. Sentenced to death, Anastasia found an unexpected lifeline, a legal technicality that granted him a retrial in 1922. Four key witnesses had mysteriously disappeared, leading to his release. 
During this time, he opted to change his surname from Anastasio to Anastasia, yet his encounters with the law persisted. In 1928, Anastasia faced murder charges in Brooklyn, but once again, witnesses vanished and the case crumbled. By the late 1920s, Anastasia had risen to prominence within the International Longshoremen's Association, ILA, wielding influence over six local chapters in Brooklyn. Anastasia's circle expanded to include future Cosa Nostra powerhouses, Joe Adonis, Charles Lucky Luciano, Vito Genovese, and Frank Costello. Anastasia's criminal record continued to accumulate. In 1932, he faced charges related to a murder committed with an ice pick, yet the absence of witnesses resulted in dropped charges. The following year, he was once again accused, this time of killing a laundry worker, but witnesses refused to testify. Albert Anastasia's role in the criminal underworld expanded when Lucky Luciano rewarded his loyalty. Luciano appointed Anastasia and Louis Lepke Bucalter, the nation's foremost labor racketeer, to lead murdering. This notorious group, also known as the Brownsville Boys, comprised Jewish and Italian contract killers operating from a candy store owned by mobster Louis Capone in Brooklyn's Brownsville neighborhood. Over its 10-year operation, Murder Inc. committed thousands of murders, most of which remained unsolved. Anastasia earned monikers like the Mad Hatter and the Lord High Executioner for his leadership in this ruthless organization. In May 1939, Anastasia allegedly ordered the murder of Morris Diamond, a Teamsters Union official in Brooklyn who opposed Bacalter's control of the garment district in Manhattan. He also orchestrated the killing of Peter Panto, an ILA activist advocating democratic reforms within the union. Panto's refusal to back down and intimidation attempts led to his disappearance and the subsequent discovery of his body in New Jersey. In 1941, the arrest of gang leader Abe Rilles, who had supplied Anastasia and Murder Inc. with hitmen for a decade, marked the beginning of the end for the notorious organization. Fearing prosecution, Anastasia placed a $100,000 bounty on Rilles's head. On November 12, 1941, Rilles was found dead on a Coney Island restaurant roof. Though officially ruled an accident, there were still suspicions of foul play. As 1942 began, Anastasia allegedly ordered the murder of an associate, Anthony Romeo, who had been arrested and questioned in the Panto case. By the end of June, Romeo's battered and bullet-riddled body was discovered near Guyancourt, Delaware. Despite being a formidable force in the mob, Anastasia officially held the position of underboss in the Mangano crime family under the leadership of Vincent Mangano. However, their relationship was fraught with tension. Mangano resented Anastasia's close ties to Luciano and Costello, particularly their recruitment of Anastasia without seeking Mangano's consent. On April 19, 1951, Vincent Mangano disappeared, never to be seen again. The same day, the body of Vincent's brother Philip was found in Jamaica Bay. Though no arrests were made, most were suspicious that Anastasia played a role in their demise. Following the Manganos' disappearance, Anastasia served as acting boss of their family. Supported by Frank Costello and Joseph Bonanno, Anastasia ascended to the position of boss, renaming the family the Anastasia family. In March 1952, Anastasia allegedly ordered the murder of Arnold Schuster, who had identified fugitive bank robber Willie Sutton. A TV interview with Schuster prompted Anastasia's chilling command, I can't stand squealers, hit that guy. On March 8, 1952, Schuster was ruthlessly gunned down in Borough Park, Brooklyn. Though government witness Joseph Valachi accused Anastasia of the murder in 1963, skepticism persisted and no arrests were made. The final chapter of Albert Anastasia's life was written on the morning of October 25, 1957, in a midtown Manhattan barbershop. As Anastasia relaxed in the barber's chair, two gunmen, their faces concealed, stormed in. Shots rang out as they fired at their unsuspecting target. Anastasia, showing incredible courage and strength, actually lunged at his assailants, mistakenly attacking their reflections in the wall mirror. The ruthless gunmen continued their assault until Anastasia lay lifeless on the floor. Albert Anastasia's life, shrouded in violence and mystery, left an enduring imprint on the annals of organized crime. If you enjoyed this video, click on the card on your screen for more content like this. See you next time.